Hi, my name is Vic Chopra, and I am here with my co-founder, Spencer Oberg, and this is Unincarcerated, the podcast. We are flipping the script and actually interviewing our podcast host, Mr. Cameron Collins. Now let's see if we're as good at this shit as he is. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, Cameron. How are you doing today? Doing okay. Doing okay. It's my dad's 80th birthday. It is. Wow. Well, happy birthday, Mr. Collins. Yeah. No kidding. Congrats, man. That's one hell of a milestone. Yeah. Yeah. Is he retired yet or is he nope. still practicing he's, law? He's still practicing law. Still going. Is he really? Keeps, keeps oh him young. God. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's a lot to live up to on your end. Oh, yeah. So how many more years of practicing law is that for you? <laughs> Almost 40. <laughs> yeah. So something to uh, look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of paperwork, Cameron. A lot for yeah. the next 40 years. <laughs> No, thank you. Can you can take solace in the fact that unlike your dad, all of yours, or at least most of yours, is now digital. So you can take it wherever you are and do it on whatever device you're on, where that shit just wasn't happening back then. No, I don't think so. Definitely not. not. for somebody that's 80. No. He, he started. I mean, how was, he must have he been so practicing law in the 60s? Mm-hmm. Yep. I think he, wow. he graduated from law school in 62. And so he, wow. would, so he, and then he got drafted into the army in Vietnam and he served as a law clerk in the army. So he's been practicing since the sixties. Yeah. So he's been practicing 60 years. Oh man. I can't even imagine Just about. the <laughs> process or what that must've been like back then. I, it's so different than now. Yeah. So speaking of, of, uh, practicing law, Cameron, tell us a little bit about how you found yourself in the law profession, uh, because Cameron is not only our podcast host and a member of the Unincarcerated Productions team and a producer, he is also our in-house entertainment attorney. Yeah. When I was six years old, the Challenger exploded, and I planned on being an astronaut. And then in front of the entire world, the Challenger blew up, and I went, <laughs> okay, well, all well, right, that, I, I don't want to be an astronaut that anymore. That totally took me off. I was not <laughs> expecting you to start <laughs> And so I decided I'll be a lawyer instead, like my dad, rather than being an astronaut, because I'm not going to go boom in the sky. So that literally just scared the shit out of you into becoming a lawyer? Yeah. Yes. Seriously. I mean, take a step back for a second. Six years old. Six years old. The Challenger exploded. Yeah. And you, first of all, fucking amazing that you already had in your mind, like, I am going to be an astronaut. I Okay. A lot of kids, you know, I'm sure I said that crap, but I don't remember it. I never said that. I have no idea if I did or not. I was going to be an engineer, an astronaut, probably a firefighter, too. I mean, all of that was just crap that my parents planted in my head. But it sounds to me like you were pretty serious about it. Because then six years old, you see this on TV and you make a decision to become like your dad. And now you are an attorney like your dad. Yeah, I think uh, for as long as I can remember, I was going to become a lawyer. I don't think I had any other path in mind, whether it was in high school, middle school, high school, college, even law school, uh, you know, now that I am a lawyer, I think most lawyers I know who are around my age or graduated at the same time as me don't want to be lawyers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a it's an interesting profession. And the one thing I always say is even if you don't practice law, it is so empowering to have a law degree and to be able to understand the law and just help people with the knowledge that you gain by going to law school and also with that piece of paper that says that you're a, a doctor of law. Oh, I can imagine. Obviously, tell us from a young age, you had this sole focus in mind, zero point focus to become an attorney. What made you actually go into the realm of entertainment law? Was that something that also you had in mind at an early age? Or was it something that you sort of fell into as you went along? I think I fell into it because of my background. You know, I didn't really know what kind of law I wanted to do. I was pretty sure I didn't want to do what my dad did. Uh, so I wanted to do a different kind of law. But I had a little bit of exposure to entertainment law through him because he represented security guards in a couple of uh, cases that happened where people got hurt in mosh pits. And so he was the lawyer for the security guards. And one was at a Rage Against the Machine show, and the other was at a Blink-182 show. And so I guess I had a I, little... I, like... <laughs> sorry, I, I, I can see accidents at rage against the machine not sure. not necessarily blink 182 though. 
<laughs> yeah, no, there's there, stone. Yeah. there's definitely yeah. mosh pits at Blink One Eighty Two shows. I've been to a, a fair share of them over the years, especially earlier okay. Blink One Eighty Two. Fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, so I think I had a little exposure to it. But really, it was that when I was in college, uh, my freshman year, so January of my freshman year, so beginning of the winter quarter, I started doing radio. And uh, I've done radio ever since, so I've actually thought about it today, and I've spent more than half my life doing radio. And so it's really weird with COVID, I'm not on the radio right now, whereas I've, I've had a weekly radio show since January 1999, except for the portion of, like, I lived in Paris for six months for uh, when I went to school there. But other than that, wow. I've done a radio show every week since 1999, unless I was sick or something. So... What? It's weird to not be there right now, but I went into radio and we can go back to radio later if you want. But, and then I started promoting shows and putting on concerts basically. And so I was already in the entertainment realm. And so when I went to law school, I ended up meeting Mark Saku, who became my law partner when I first came out of law school and we formed Saku Collins Entertainment and Media Law Group. He was also interested in entertainment law and we, we, I think we knew each other, but we really met and connected in a, an arts legal clinic where we actually would work with lawyers and have real clients come in and then as students work with the individuals there who came in. And so that really got me interested in like, I could really do this. And uh, the dean of the law school at the time really encouraged me because she was my advisor my first year of law school and uh, before she was dean. And so I think it just was kind of a natural progression because that's what I did. I was in the music scene and stuff like that. I didn't do a lot of film type stuff or authors, all that kind of stuff before this, before I became a lawyer. But that's kind of, I think over time, I've kind of moved away from music, although I still have a few music clients and started doing more film, books, that kind of stuff. But ultimately, I do a lot of small business stuff because it's all small business, right? If you if you are a band, if you're making a movie, whatever you are, you need to have some sort of business entity. So it becomes small business law in the end. It just has very specific industry, entertainment industry stuff, depending on what industry it is. And and what made you want to transition over to the, the movie and books and kind of more away from the music scene? I think that it's just kind of how the clients came. So it wasn't really, I don't, I don't, I, I don't necessarily seek out, people seek me out for help. And I really like the movie stuff. You know, I think the, f I've worked on some stuff, but the first big project I'd done was Sonic Skate. Uh, which I ended up also being a producer on, which was a documentary that ESPN currently owns the rights to. And I think CNBC had it before, which is about the Supersonics moving from Seattle to Oklahoma City and kind of the short history of the Supersonics and why that ended up happening. So that was the first one that I was super involved with. How were you involved with, like, in, in what capacity were you involved in Sonic's Gate? I came on as the lawyer, but then because I was just there all the time and helped on the business side of stuff, I'm an associate producer on that as well. And so, and we, we went to, we showed it in Portland, showed it in New York city. So we went, went up to ESPN and, and, uh, they interviewed the director there. So we, we've been around, around the country, uh, showing the film. So it was, it was a pretty awesome experience. Now is producing something that you see more for yourself at, you know, in, in the future, obviously it seems that you sort of just on Sonic Skate fell into that role just by what you were doing in that capacity. But is that something you would like to continue pursuing? For sure. I think, uh, you know, every single film that I've worked on, I've done some level of being a producer. Uh, you know, uh, Nothing Against Life was the film that came after that, which is a feature film uh, Julio Ramirez made. And that one, I was also an associate producer on it. And, uh, you know, even other films where I'm just listed as a lawyer, I probably uh, sh could have been given an associate producer title. So yeah, I think my skills are so varied across the board in terms of like legal work, the business side of film, stuff like that, and con connecting people that it, it, it really, I think producing is where I would like to go more than lawyering. You know, lawyering is fine. I, I can do the work, but it's not where my passion is. My passion is the artistic project coming to fruition more than did we turn in the proper paperwork to make sure we got this done. Like, I know that stuff, I'll do it, but I'm all about the final product, not the necessarily the, the uh, legal steps to get there. That's awesome. And it kind of brings up something for me. I, 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 you listed a lot of ways that you contribute to projects, but I didn't hear creatively in there. So I'm wondering, do you consider yourself a creative? You know, this is a hard one because uh, I never have. And one of the reasons is because when I have tried to be in bands and stuff like that, I'm just mediocre. I'm mediocre at 
playing instruments, whether it was guitar, bass, or organ, although I'm best at organ and keyboard. Uh, you know, I'm not, so when I'm helping out bands, I'm more like the guy behind the scenes. I'm not there. But with films, I, I can't picture necessarily how things should look when they're not already created. But I do have the ability to watch stuff and give ideas on where stuff should go, which is why I think uh, one of the reasons I've been a producer on some films is because I'm actually giving input on the actual process as well. So, uh, you know, I think you, Spencer, maybe have said that that I have a creative mind, but I, I've never thought about it that way because I am I have this lawyer brain, right? That kind of the 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 law poisons your brain in a way that makes things very straightforward and literal, and and so and and like even when you're writing, you're not writing flowery sentences. You're writing to the point sentences that are short, and and just cut it as much as you can. You don't need all that other stuff around it. So, law school kind of killed most of my creativity in a lot of ways. Now, creating contracts is like a jigsaw puzzle. And so you have to put all this stuff together. And I'm a giant nerd. And so when I'm building a contract, <laughs> you have to make sure that all the pieces fit. And so you could say that's creative in some ways. But to me, that's just doing my job. Well, I, I would agree with your, uh, one of your last statements there. It is definitely creative in a lot of ways. And I have way more experience in law more on the criminal side, but still also having to do with a lot of contracts, um, but still on the, the criminal side is, this is a rabbit hole we don't need to go down. <laughs> but, but, but criminal law is mainly contracts because most people enter into plea agreements, which is mm. a contract. But in any case, uh, with all of this stuff that I did for my own, uh, own appeals and other people's while I was inside, I studied the law a lot and I completely... I know where you're coming from. It, it can feel like it's killing your creativity and a little bit of your soul every time that you know you're forced to to drag yourself through another another piece of case law that is kind of that seems kind of redundant. But at the same time, you really do have to be creative to figure out how all these pieces fit together and how you can either make the best contract or make the best argument. Just knowing you, as I have come to, which uh, I think is maybe better than some, not as much as I'd like to, or as much as, as others. But I, I know that you have a lot of creativity that you bring to our team that I'm very, that we're all very uh, blessed to have. So one of these days, I'll get you to, uh, to quit putting those caveats in there and just say, yeah, I'm a creative motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think what it is, is I, I know I have creativity in my brain. My problem has always been how to get it out of there into the world. And, you know, I think about like, I know that if I could read music properly and get what's in here onto a keyboard or onto a guitar, I could have written hit songs. I could have written, you know, been a producer and put out some amazing beats and stuff like that. It's just, I don't have that ability to do it. And, and part of that's my fault because I never learned how to do it. I didn't put in the effort or time to do it because I have all this other stuff that I always want to do. But, uh, you know, it, I, I think it's in there. It's just, how do we pull it out of me? I, I definitely view you as a creative. It may, may not be in the traditional aspect or, or viewpoint that you're thinking in your head as far as taking pen to paper and writing something or like physically creating something or a song, but you have created so much in your career. Uh, so I, I really think that you need to give yourself enough credit. Uh, let me tell you, I've, I've made some pretty amazing mixtapes that required a lot of creativity <laughs> for women I've tried to date over the years. So. Yeah. <laughs> See? Oh my God, I love I it. Yeah, yeah, told you. I want to know a little bit more about who Cameron Collins is. You're a lawyer, mm -hmm. you're a creative, and we'll get you to admit it at some point fully. You're a DJ. You're a radio host, you're a podcast host, and I would also say director and producer and editor, and you do a damn good job at it. Mm -hmm. What? Who? Who are you? What's important to you? And... And how did it become to be important? You know, it's interesting. Uh, and don't forget, I'm a professor, just because I put oh, a lot yeah. of effort in that. <laughs> well, we hadn't yeah. talked about that yet. So yeah, we, we had. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and I forgot about it the multi, other day when multi, we were in a conversation. Multi -hyphenate. Uh, for me, it's all related, right? It, it, it's all, even if it doesn't seem like it, it is. And interestingly, a lot of it, I think, comes from my Jesuit education. I'm not a religious person, but I, did, I grew up Catholic, but I, I stopped going to church when I was like 12. 
And so I think in an effort to make me religious again, my parents stuck me in Catholic school for high school. And, uh, and so, but it was, it was Seattle prep locally. And then I went to Santa Clara university and then I came back to Seattle university. They were all Jesuit schools and the Jesuits are all about social justice. And so for me, what I think it is, what underlies almost everything I, I do is a sense of fairness, or at least trying to create a sense of fairness in the world and also helping others. I think those are the two points. So whether it was when I started my law firm with Saku, we all want, it was low cost legal service for artists and musicians. It was about you, they couldn't afford to go to these, you know, 300, 500, $1,000 an hour people. So we're going to do it at a lower rate for them. Musically, I guess radio, it started out just because I loved music, but it went on from there. You know, it's funny. I, my love of music, the music, movies, and sports, I think, defined my childhood through high school. And part of it was, is growing up as the fat guy, I wasn't dating. Girls weren't interested in me. So I loved movies. I loved music. And I loved sports. And because of my political circles I travel in, there's not a lot of sports fans. Because liberal people don't tend to like sports as much. And I love sports so much. Like, they, I, I think I don't... I mean, I know you guys know I do Sounder stuff, and we didn't even talk about any of that stuff. I'm into uh, the yeah, Seahawks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm into all that kind of stuff. But I don't, it's not like I'm going to walk up to you and be like, hey, did you see that Seahawks score or something like that? Because it's just, I don't, unless it's me trying to connect with the guys of something like that. Hmm. If they're into sports, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah. But I don't, I don't really talk about all those a- aspects of me. But to me, it's all artistic, and it's, it's all interrelated in a way that, it sounds weird, right? It's sports, whatever. But if you look at, say, the history of the civil rights movement, sports really helped push the civil rights movement forward. And so there's a book by Dave Zirin called uh, The People's History of Sports in the United States. And so he goes through, like, you know, Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, people like that, Kurt Flood, uh, who basically became the first free agent. And I think he had to sue to become a free agent in NFL history. And you look at the history of all that stuff, it kind of is all related to this way of fairness, equality, equity, and whatnot that I think came originally from that Jesuit education. I didn't think about it at the time. It didn't really kick in until I think I was in college, post 9-11. But in high school, they put all these ideas in my head. And then I went, oh, I get it now. Because I grew up super privileged kid, right? Like going to a nice, expensive, private Catholic school. And none of that stuff really resonated with me until later. And, and, to my parents' credit, they made me work 40 hours a week at Safeway while I was going to school and honors classes and full-time so I could buy my own car and stuff like that. So they, they deserve credit, too, for really pushing me to create a work ethic and, and, and stuff like that as well. Oh, definitely. You, you don't strike me as the you know silver or platinum spoon uh, <laughs> syndrome kind of person. You're, um, you're, you're really down to earth. But it, it's interesting that you kind of bring it full circle back to your education and it's also interesting that really underpinning all of these different things that you do and all of your different interests, which I want to, I want you to share a little bit more about. I think we've heard some tidbits thrown out here and there because we haven't talked about them yet. And you're like, Hey, wait a second. I do this too. You, you do so many things. It's, it's hard to keep up with you, honestly. And I want to hear more about those. And, and, and I maybe a little bit about how, well, I just want to hear more about those, because I think as you talk about them, it'll become obvious what about those is related to that underpinning passion for social justice and equity that you were talking about. Yeah. So I think Sounders wise. Yeah, first, that was, was yeah. going to be my. Yeah. Let's talk about the, your work with the Sounders. So I think that's a, it's a good place to start. And so right now I am acting president because we haven't had a board meeting. Otherwise, I'd be president uh, of Gorilla FC, which is one of the four Seattle Sounders supporter groups. And so in soccer, rather than there being like just one fan base, there's organized supporter groups that kind of do their own thing. Uh, the Sounders have four. If you've ever watched a game, there's the crazy fans behind the goal that do in-stadium stuff. That's Emerald City supporters. That's not what we do. Gorilla FC is a 501c3 nonprofit that uses soccer to build community. So our mission is anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-homophobic, uh, and we do end identify as Antifa, which has become a hot button word lately, (laughs) but, but we've been using it for since 2009. So it's interesting that that's now become a hot button word when it wasn't before. And so 
it shows you how the world is changing in a lot of interesting ways that we don't necessarily need to get in here. But we do things like this before I was involved, but in Haiti, when they had the earthquake in Haiti, raised twenty thousand dollars for Red Cross or, you know, when there's disasters, do other stuff like that build tiny houses for the homeless every summer. We didn't do it this summer, obviously, and last summer we had to cancel it, but the previous summer we did two houses, and then we've done one house the summers before that, and then we'll be doing two whenever COVID's gone and we can start doing more houses again. So we have all the money ready to go. So that one is about using our fandom for the club of the Sounders and then going out into the community to benefit the community. Through that, I got involved with the Alliance Council, which is the Sounders fan government. So you're the voice of the fans to the club, and you have direct access to the front office. Uh, I'm, as of last December, and so my term's almost up, but I hopefully I'm going to run again, and we'll see if I win. But uh, I, am, I was elected president of that. So I'm president of the fan government. So I'm in regular meetings with the front office every week. You know, we, we meet with ownership quite often, and the general manager of the club... And also through that process, I got asked to be on the Seattle or the Rave Foundation or Seattle Sounders COVID Relief Fund through the Rave Foundation. And so we raised and, and gave out grants of over a million dollars to people that who were affected by the Sounders not playing. And so it'd be like businesses around the stadium, employees who worked for the club, uh, not for the club directly, but, you know, like in the stadium who was like the hot dog vendors and all that kind of stuff. Uh, restaurants in the ID and Pioneer Square, stuff like that, that if there was a game, suddenly you have 40,000 people there, they're going to eat there. Well, that's 20 games a year. Uh, I think we got three home games in, so 17 games that they're not going to get all that money coming in. And so yeah. people were able to apply for these grants, and we gave out over a million dollars to individuals and, and local restaurants and businesses. Wow. That's amazing. It is. Tell us a little bit about... Uh, being a law professor and and how that came into play in your life. So when I was a third year law student, I took an entertainment law course at Seattle U. And after that, it wasn't offered again. And so that was 2006. 2009 came around. I went into the school and was like, hey, this class isn't being offered anymore. Can I teach it? And they were like, okay. So I developed my, <laughs> yeah, I was like, eh. so I developed my own curriculum went in and first taught it in 2010 and uh they were supposed to cap it at 35 students and i walked into the room and there were 60 and my class was built for 35 because there was presentations and stuff like that it was also the first time i taught i was probably like 30 years old at the time around there and so there was people in the class that were in their 50s and so I had never taught before and I'm walking into a room and having to tell people who have way more life experience than me, hey, this is what you need to know. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but it took me, you know, that whole semester to get my legs under me and really understand that I'm the expert, at least I pretend to be when I'm in front of the classroom. And so they don't know whether or not I am or I aren't. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. And so I went in there and, and did it the first time and then it's gotten better ever since, but that kind of led me to love teaching. And that's really where my passion is more than lawyering is teaching. And even when I'm a lawyer, I would teach cause I'd get my client and be like, Hey, let's talk about this. So like, can we pay you to do this? I'm like, yes, but I want you to understand what we're doing. And if you can do it on your own, great, because usually people are going to be like, well, I don't want to screw it up. I'll pay you to do it. So a lot of my lawyering was actually teaching too. And I ended up, it took, a, it was a while, but now I guess four years ago, I think it was, I started teaching law and the arts at the grad and undergrad level at Seattle U. And then I ended up applying for a job and I also teach or have taught law and society, uh, constitutional law and law and public policy which I focus on arts and culture at University of Washington, Tacoma. And I know this year I should be teaching undergrad law and the arts and undergrad law and public policy whenever in the spring quarter. So uh, I love teaching. It's just, it's, it's amazing to have these conversations with students and it's a little different now that it's online. But assuming everyone does the reading material, reads it, we walk in, we can have a discussion around it and I learn new stuff from the students. I learn new ways of thinking. Like we talked about before, the lawyer mind is very kind of black and white sometimes. It's like, this is the law. It's very rigid. 
but they'll go, hey, what about this? What about that? And, it, and like thinking about like remix culture. Well, if we're talking about copyright, technically remix culture is against the law. But the more we talk, I talk about the students, the more I go, well, these copyright laws are meant to benefit large corporations for the most part, Disney, people like that who keep getting it extended. So there needs to be a way where we can rewrite these laws to benefit the actual people who want to make creative endeavors. And so that's something that I never would have learned had I not interacted with my students. And so uh, I learn, I wouldn't say as much from my students, but I learn a lot from my students and they look at things differently and they all bring their unique perspective based on their background, which is very different than mine, especially at UW Tacoma. And so, uh, yeah, teaching in terms of a profession outside of working with unincarcerated is my passion now. I love it. I'd like to do it all the time, but I'll do it a lot less once we're doing just unincarcerated projects all the time. <laughs> uh, okay, so you just hit two things there. I, I want to unpack two things. First, before we jump off of the teaching piece of it, I'm curious, what was it that drove you to walk into Seattle U, pretty fresh out of law school, and say, hey, why aren't you offering this class? Can I teach it? What, what was it? I mean, was that class so impactful for you that you were like, how, why, why in the hell aren't you guys still offering this? I think that's part of it. I mean, I still, the framework for contracts, maybe not all the wording, but the, the formatting of a contract is still, that I use today, is still identical to the one that I use for the final project in that class. I got, there's a thing called a Cali Award, which is like the award for excellence in the future of subjects. I got two in law school, both my final semester. One was in entertainment law. The other was criminal proce investigative criminal procedure, which is a whole different field, <laughs> nowhere near it. So yeah, no basically, kidding. because I ran the National Lawyers Guild in law school, who are the people who go to protests and, and they're legal observers that just watch what's going on. They don't actually take part in the protests and make sure the police don't violate the constitutional rights of the protesters. I knew all that stuff. And so I and, and the teacher who taught it, I was her TA. And so I was into that kind of stuff a lot. And so I guess RA, I was a research assistant, not a teaching assistant. So I got it in the entertainment law course with the Cali Award, and I still structure my contracts the way that I structured it in that class. So we are 14 years later, and the meat, the bones, not the meat, the bones, the basic outline of the contract is still the same today as it was in May 2006 when I wrote that agreement. So Yeah, so I'd say it had an impact on you. Yeah, yeah just, it definitely yeah. had an impact. I think the other thing was at the time... I was thinking about going and getting my LLM, which is a, a master's of law in intellectual property. And the reason was because I liked the idea. I, w I wanted to be a professor. And for some reason in law, the Juris Doctor, the doctorate degree is before the master's degree, which is flipped from every other profession. So technically I'm a doctor of law. So if I'm teaching college, they can call me Dr. Collins or whatever. I just tell them to call me Cameron. I don't care about all that stuff. So I thought about getting that. And there was a good program at Santa Clara and there was a good program at UW. And then I just walked in and I started teaching. So I'm like, why would I go do that when I'm already doing the job I want to <laughs> <Yeah>. do? <laughs> so, like, oh, hey, I just short-circuited the process. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, why pay more money for a degree I don't need? Right. I don't need to go take out more student loans. <laughs> good so, stuff. So, yeah, and that's that's kind of how, how I went in. And I was just like, also, I wanted others at the school to be able to take the class I took. That's awesome. And then you you alluded to something that I think our listeners are really interested to hear, considering this is the unincarcerated podcast. Exactly. How, well, first of all, maybe before we dive into how you got involved with unincarcerated, what does unincarcerated mean to you? Hmm. What is our, what is our cause, our company, our mission? You know, what, what does that mean to you? I think uh, it kind of goes back to that idea of justice and fairness that we talked about coming out of that Jesuit education. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, just because I went into entertainment law, it doesn't mean that I didn't have all those aspects. I wrote, you know, I took human rights classes and I wrote papers on the death penalty and, and you know, e economic justice courses and all that stuff is intertwined. And I was also going to law school during the Bush era. So it was a lot of stuff around then, especially in Florida where you had all of the felons had their voting rights removed, which we're still seeing happening all over. In fact, now I think in Florida, a bunch of people are being currently purged from the from the voter rolls because they haven't paid their fines. And in Florida, they still require that. 
So that was a passion of mine. Also, the, the professor who taught that criminal procedure class kind of intertwined with the uh, National Lawyers Guild stuff. And then uh, when I was a research assistant, I was researching police brutality at the FTAA Miami protests. And it was supposed to be for a documentary, but they ended up being used in trials to get people off who had been charged with crimes. And then we'd have footage and be like, look at this footage. They didn't do what they said they did. And then they would get off. So wow. <clears throat> kind of shit. having yeah, having crazy. that, that it, it, it's an interesting now because how much that conversation is happening now. Should we be filming the protests that are going on now? What's happening? You know, all, there's all sorts of stuff. And I come from that from the perspective of, well, if the police are going to say something, you did something you didn't do, then you want it filmed because you don't want to go to jail. Because it's going to be their your word against yours. And we can have footage to show that you didn't do that. A, a lot of that, even though I went to entertainment law, I had the whole human rights, you know, criminal law stuff was there. It just wasn't where I went with the law. But it was where a lot of my passion lies. And so unincarcerated actually lets me bring a lot of that side of myself that's not the entertainment law side and bring it to fruition in new ways. This notion that you can take the stigma of formerly incarcerated people in society and start changing the narrative around it, I think is huge. And it's much needed. I didn't need to be sold on it as soon as I heard about what it was because I'm like, yes, this is amazing. And knowing that you two were able to, you know, I don't know if poster children is the right thing, but you know what I mean? Like you've lived it, you've done it. And we can see, like, look, this is achievable for other people. This narrative that we have in the media about criminals, and obviously we're on a podcast, so you can't see that I just put quotation marks around it, negates their humanity, no matter what the crime is. You know, you could be talking about little petty crime, and suddenly that person is a criminal for the rest of their life. They get branded that. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, your life could be over. But what we see from you two is that's not the case. You can change the narrative, and that's what you two are doing, and I want to be a part of that. Well, it's such an honor to have you on the team, and, and thank you for saying that as well. That that means a lot, I, I know, to myself and, and Spencer as well. Because that, I mean, that is our mission. That's what we're trying to do is shift the collective consciousness, you know, and just for it to be so clear and that mission to resonate so quickly with you, I think was just so amazing and, and how just, you know, you jumped aboard full force. But I, I want to just dig into how the connection was made, right? For those of mm. us that weren't a part of it or, or, or don't know, because there was, it was Spencer that found you ultimately, because we were, you know, in search of an, an entertainment attorney. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that story. Yeah. Had you talked yeah. to any lawyers before me? Sort of. <laughs> I talked to a prosecutor. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> So seriously, though. well, I think well, Spencer and I both have talked to a lot of lawyers in our day. <laughs> I have for sure, but but for unincarcerated specifically, the only attorney that I'd reached out to was uh, somebody who I have come to consider a friend and ally and and uh, mentor even, who's in the King County Prosecutor's Office, and he's a I don't know if he's still a board member, but he was a board member of University Beyond Bars, which is an organization that I was heavily involved in when I was incarcerated. And he, he was just somebody that I knew would, would point me in the right direction and without trying to get anything out of it himself, for sure. And also just with my utmost best interest in, in mind, which is certainly not how I feel about 99.9% of prosecutors <laughs> in general. <laughs> but it just shows that just, I, mean, I don't want to go down this, this rabbit hole, but that, that sentiment shows that we're all human beings and on on both sides of this, of the current system, there are good people and there are bad people. And there are you know, people that buck the systemic trends and do the right thing. And there are people who don't. He's, he's one who does the right thing and, and who I trust. And when I reached out to him and told him that some of the stuff that I was talking about doing while I was in there, I was doing, and I'd started unincarcerated with Vic and, and was trying to put together a team and needed a, an attorney you were the first person that he recommended. He said, he said, well, given that I'm a criminal prosecutor, I don't know a lot of entertainment lawyers, but I do know one individual who I went to law school with that I think would just be perfect. 
And so he referred me to you. Yeah, I remember, I think we set up a phone. You maybe, I don't know if you emailed me or you, you called me first, but we set up a phone call. And I remember I was actually at Seattle University because I had an intern for the summer. Uh, a guy who was going to University of Miami for law school and was back home in Seattle. And uh, he wanted a job. And I was like, okay, we can make up a job. I don't have any money to pay you, but I'll give you free. I mean, and he, he wasn't, you know, I, I don't like unpaid internships in general because they're they're inherently unfair. But we weren't doing paid work anyways. We were just doing stuff like a movie that's going to come out, that a documentary that probably never make a dime off of. And so we were just working on contracts for that. And I'd buy him lunch every day. So he actually ended up probably I, <laughs> making money in the end. <laughs> Not really. But uh, and uh, actually, interestingly, today, he just asked me to write his recommendation for the bar exam in Washington State. But, uh, you know, we were just working. And I think we hopped on the phone. I was at Seattle U just working and uh, and connected and had a good conversation. And then you were like, I want you to meet the team. And then I think what really sold it for me was that Vic really liked my gremlin shirt when we went out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's what, that, you wore that to, to happy hour, right? When yeah, it was, it was a, 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 a old a gremlins VHS box t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, no. So so we ended up meeting the whole team. And I think that immediately it was a pretty good, I felt a pretty good connection. Um, and I didn't know where it would go from there. I just figured I was going to do some contracts or, or LLC stuff for you. And then, you know, move on about my business. And then that's not what you guys had in mind, though. You were like, no, 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 no not at all. I think <laughs> yeah. we like to rope people in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think from the get go, we saw such a larger role for you to play uh, just based off of that first meeting. Right. I mean, well, you and I, I mean, to this day, I mean, literally to today, talk about pop culture like like every day and i think that's what bonded you and i we both have this love of movies and music and and just kind of the obscure side of things or you know like kind of in the know about directors or or this and that and the other and and i think that's like when i saw your your gremlins shirt i was like fuck yeah okay cool (laughs) i'm i'm picking up i'm picking up his vibe i like it i dig it and i have to say that that was the first time I had ever met an attorney in that kind of attire. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could. Complete... It was. It, I came away from our first call like that was the best first introduction introductory call I think I've ever had. Really, period. But most certainly for unincarcerated, like you and I, we, we clicked. We had a vibe. We were completely on the same wa- same wavelength, and you you understood the mission and the vision like intrinsically. It was amazing, just from a phone call. And that doesn't usually happen. Usually, for me, it's, I need to meet people, right? It's that. that. Yeah, they need, they need to see it in front of their eyes and rather than just hear about it. Like, they need to actually meet us and see Spencer or I and be like, okay. Yeah. Now, and vice now, versa. Yeah. Like, now. I need to see you. I need to, like, meet you and feel that connection, mm-hmm. right? Just it, That's just, I think it's kind of what we're programmed to be like. But it wasn't like that for me. I was sold before I even met you. And with that gremlin t-shirt and my preconceived notions about what an attorney should be, probably a good thing. Same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you blew, you blew away any expectations I ever had about what an attorney um, is like or acts like or looks like. So I mean, that's um, the thing. Awesome, it, people the people yeah. expect attorneys to be in suits. I think I've maybe to a couple funerals and maybe one wedding but most weddings I still would just wear a sweater and some slacks. So I don't wear suits. Like I haven't since law school. Uh, it's not, it's not my thing. And also some, if I showed up in a suit to some meetings, people would be like, what? We're just going to talk yeah, about what? this band stuff or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what are you doing? Who are but, you? <laughs> but I, even in law school though, I was known as the, the kid, I was always wearing like a black band hoodie and black jeans and stuff like that. So even in law school, I was not dressing that, you know, everyone tries to dress up nice and look good. I'm like, I'm going to wear what I want. Like, and I, I, I love that. I, you know, there might be some times where I will dress nicer because first, like with my students, I'm going to, I'm going to wear nice clothes if I'm in person the first time. And then over time I start getting, you know, I, I wear tennis shoes, the second class, and then, it, and then it switches over time because I want that initial respect because they have to listen to me. Uh, but I wasn't coming to you in that way. I was coming to you as peers. And that's how I view yep. my clients is they're my peers. I don't know more than you. I just know different stuff than you. Mm. A hundred percent. And I, that's one, one of the things that I think speaks, it speaks for itself and your actions speak almost louder than your words, which 
you definitely aren't afraid to to speak out about our cause but the the action that action of of exactly what you just said i'm gonna wear what the fuck i want right like i'm gonna be me and people need to just respect me for being me and my peers need to respect me for being me and i think that's a big piece of the message that we're trying to push is that we aren't what whatever people's preconceived notions are of us we are us we're amazing human beings Mm -hmm. and just like you you're an amazing human being and a great lawyer and you don't need to wear a fucking suit in order to be that right it's and so i love i love that uh it it threw me for a loop the first time that we met but it, it spoke volumes to me exactly like what i just said it it showed me that you are a great fit for what we're doing. Which, well, by the way, I, I, that meant that Rachel was way overdressed because she was wearing work attire and none of the rest oh, of yeah. us were. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel was way overdressed. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Too funny. I think that, you know, you bring this element of punk rock to, to the team, but I think ultimately what our mission is and what we're trying to do and who we are is fucking punk rock a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, it just meshed so well with, with everything that we were trying to do. And, and it's, yeah, it's it's just amazing to have you be part of the team. And it's only grown from there, right? I mean, you you mentioned that you came on you you agreed to be a part of it because you loved the mission and the, you know, the vision all that vibe with you. But it was really in your mind going to be kind of constrained to legal services. But it's grown from there, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, definitely. This podcast being the most obvious version of that, right? Like, I don't think we set out at any time going, we're going to make a podcast. This was not the intention. I think when COVID hit, much like many people across the world, we had to go, we need to rethink some of the stuff we're doing. What can we do right now? Mm -hmm. Uh, And you know, like you two are in the same room right now. I'm immunocompromised, so I don't see a lot of people. And so the way I am involved, I think has changed somewhat in a different way than it would be otherwise. But I think that's good, right? Like this podcast is a way for us to introduce the team to the world and then can evolve into something else where we actually can start having the conversations we are going to have through all the other media sources, you know, whether film, television, whatever, through the audio format as well. So we can reach people that way and have people come tell their stories to us and see like the perception you have of someone who's been to prison is not the reality. Listen to this person and they're going to change your mind. And we can do that on an episode by episode basis moving forward. Speaking of which, what was your perception of somebody that had been to prison that had done time before meeting Spencer and I? Just curious. It's interesting. You know, I, I, I'm sure I've known people that have done time before, but never on that level. I know, I definitely know people who've done time before, but never on the close level that, that I've gotten to know you two before. I think my impression was more of a, what's the word I'm looking for? An academic one, because like the messaging I agree with, right? The ideas behind unincarcerated, I'm all in on, but I didn't have the examples to put that to. So I, I believed that there's room for rehabilitation for people. You know, I think ultimately when the idea of prisons, like we have to take criminal law when you're in law school and you learn about the history and all that kind of stuff. There's like, it's like retribution, rehabilitation, and I forget what the third R is, but there's three things. But all American really does, America does is retribution. We don't do the rehabilitation. And to me, that is the most important thing. If you're not, you know, and maybe there's some people that are not, you can't rehabilitate them. That's outside the scope of what we're talking about, really. Most people you can. And why should those people, and this was before I had an idea of who those people were, be kept outside of society when they can become functioning members of society? You know, there, there's, uh, I think, Vic, you like to use the phrase like a a phoenix rising from the ashes, right? You don't, you don't need to be that person you were. You are not that person you were. And although you have a daily, hourly, weekly, monthly struggle to make sure that you don't go back to addiction, you've done it successfully, and you are that phoenix rising out of the ashes. There's no way that anyone should look at you today and say, well, 
but look who he used to be. Because that's not who you are. And the fact that society would limit your ability to be successful, to be happy, to make the world a better place, that's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We agree. It's fucked up. <laughs> right. So so I think for me it was academic. Like I had the background. You know, I I studied all this kind of stuff. But the people I'd known to been to prison, it was not for long terms. They were usually like friends of friends or stuff like that. Otherwise, it's what's in the media, right? It's the TV shows, it's the movies, it's Shawshank Redemption and <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, I never watched Orange Is the New Black, so I don't I don't know much about that besides the previews. But uh, you know, and 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 there's this weird disconnect in my brain, right? Because I love true crime stuff, mm. but like there's this podcast I absolutely love called Crime Junkie, and they've actually done a better job over time. They did this weird balancing act between the two, but you know, too often I feel like, and, and like Law and & Order, those types of TV shows, too often you only get the police side of things, you don't get the other side of things. But most of the true crime stuff is like serial killers and, and stuff like that. So it's a little different. But even... A little bit more sensationalized. Yeah, it's sensationalized, right? Yeah. It, it's not... Your average individual who's been to prison is not a serial killer. No. No, that's very, very few and far between. Very few. Yeah. So like a one percent, yeah, less. <laughs> probably less, yeah, less. But but to show how successful those shows are, right? Like Law and Order SVU, when Elliot Stabler, the character, was still on the show, he would regularly violate the constitutional rights of the defendants in that show, and he'd be like, "Yeah, get him, Elliot Stabler," even though in my personal beliefs, I would be totally pissed if that happened in real life. But that shows you how even those shows and the way they sensationalize things can kind of warp your mind around what actually mm-hmm. is going on 100 percent, which can be dangerous because that uh, pop culture and the media is really how our society forms that collective consciousness around these societal issues yeah right? i mean it's representation right mm-hmm. for the majority of the source sources and media that people have this this correlation of what a criminal is or somebody that commits a crime our representation has been this one-sided, you know, very black and white criminals are bad, fuck them up, arrest them, put them away. Who cares if you're violating their rights, Jack Bauer them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just straight up go keep for Sutherland on them. And uh, you know, cause, and just throw caution to the wind at, at what their rights are. So it's, that's the stigma. And that's what we are pushing against with what we are trying to do. Let's think about my nephew. That one time you called and was like, Hey, can you meet in a few minutes? And I was like, sure. And he asked who you were. And I kind of talked about it and that you had been to prison. And now we're working on this project to kind of change it. And he went, so he's a bad guy. My nephew's Mm -hmm. eight, nine, he's nine. And so I actually had Vic talk to him. And afterwards Mm -hmm. he's never said that again. And so you he know, was really cute too. He was like, at the end, he was like, "I'm sorry, I called you a bad guy." <laughs> yeah. I was like, "Oh, yeah, all right, buddy." Like, but yeah, exactly. but that society that's... has molded. And he lives in Idaho, so it's probably even more than here. But mm, society yeah. has molded his brain. At nine years old, that's all he knows is that if you've been yeah. to jail, you are a bad guy. The end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the viewpoint I had. Me too. Right. That's growing up that's ironic a, but yeah, true but yeah 100 percent. three strikes you're out rule made sense to me back in the day right it's like oh yeah well if they if they fucked up three times put them away for life like you know and that's just this warped mindset that you are conditioned to believe in based on everything that we are exposed to right yeah and it also doesn't factor in all of the nuance and the way that we deal with so many other societal issues in this country it doesn't factor in how we deal with drug addiction or how we deal with mental health. Systemic racism. Or systemic racism. Yep. Yep. Or, I mean, fill in the blank. Our answer in this country to damn near everything, every societal problem outside of crime and including crime, is prison. And it's the way that it's represented in media doesn't, doesn't take that into account. And it, it, doesn't give, it doesn't give people a good, well-rounded understanding of the issues that they live within and you know it's easy for people to do the old ostrich with the head in the sand Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. syndrome and you know if it doesn't affect me then why should i care why should i waste my brain power thinking about it right and all the input they're getting is negative because your local news 
just, you know, I'd say 50% of it is like, this crime happened, this place got broken into, this happened there, and doesn't bring up those contexts of what's the role of poverty, what's the role of race, how do those intersect, what's the role of mental health in all of this. And so rather than dealing with a mental health crisis, rather than dealing with addiction crises, rather than dealing with poverty, it's you just put anyone who runs afoul of the law in jail, when if you, you're just ultimately dealing with the symptoms rather than the root cause. And you got to go down and get those root causes rather than the crimes that follow in those instances. And so, yeah, it's it, everything people get inundated with from the entertainment media to news to the words that come out of both presidential candidates' mouths is law and order, crime, bad, put them in jail. Yep. It's interesting because I, I think almost maybe a little bit contrary to Vic and I, at least at some point in our lives, you before getting involved with unincarcerated, and obviously our, our opinion changed way before we started unincarcerated, but you had, at least in theory, a, a position that agrees a lot with what we stand for, that equity, you know, equity over... Retribution. The, the retribution or the iron yep. fist of the, the quote unquote justice system or, or, you know, whatever euphemism you want to use. I'm curious, how would you articulate how your perspective has changed since getting involved with us? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it definitely has taken those academic ideas and humanized them because I see people behind it. Uh, there's also been things I've had to struggle with, things uh, not in terms of you two, but, you know, conversations we've had where I know my first impression will be, well, oh, this person's a murderer. Well, are they that person today? Does that matter? And so I still have to go through those processes because I am still inundated by all that stuff. You know, like I'm not free of society. I don't live in a vacuum. And so even though it's academically there, even though I have you guys in front of me, I still have to remember to give the benefit of the doubt to other people. And I, and I don't want to give any specific examples right now because it might give away some projects that we're working on. But there are times where I have to go, oh, I'm going to take this person for who they are right now to me. And all that stuff before, we can't worry about that because it's over. And I hope that the person has been rehabilitated, but that's not for me to say. That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to change the narrative overall. We're trying to change the stigma and so I can't have judgment upon other people in that way. And I still struggle with that sometimes because I definitely don't judge either of you those ways. Like when I hear your stories, it's just like, whoa, that's crazy. I can't believe you went through that. Like the strength to be able to come out on the other side and do what you're doing now. I don't know if I would have that. So, so I still struggle with some of that stuff because I'm, I'm still dealing with society's negativity. But ultimately, I think it's just taken my academic positions and hardened them into this is the reality because I've actually seen people who have dealt with the system in a way that I've never been involved with before. You're not alone, by the way. Yeah, I we, was just thinking that. Yeah, we, we both, both we both struggle with that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people with our background and, and our rap sheets and our experience, sure, it's easy for us to to see each other and to see people like us and, and say, well, you're, you aren't who you used to be in those experiences. While anybody hurt in the process is certainly regrettable and not something that we would, would willingly repeat. We wouldn't change what happened because it's helped mold us into who we are. It's given us the mm -hmm. opportunity to grow and to become who we are. And, and the same for so many people, who we've had the opportunity to meet and get to know through our journey. But there are individuals and there are crimes that, and I won't go into specifics <laughs> for the same reason you won't. Yeah. Don't want to give anything, don't want to give anything away or, or dive down that rabbit hole. But there, there are those that I struggle with still internally. And it's, it is because of that societal conditioning that I've, that I've been inundated with and that I'm still inundated with. And it's interesting because Prior to now, and even I suppose, well, I haven't experienced it recently, but for a very good chunk of time while I was incarcerated and thereafter, immediately thereafter, I, the internalization of that stigma and of everything that's, you know, uh, 
blasted onto us by the media, I felt like that bad guy, right? It was that the internal definition that I had of myself was, was, was stigmatized even after all of that work for the better part of a decade to, to grow and overcome that. Like it was still, it was still something I had to deal with when I got out into society and was faced with the interaction with, you know, direct interaction with society. And so it, it is a real thing that, um, that, I think we all, as members of the human race and society as it is now, that we all have to confront. And it's a big piece of what our work is here. Speaking of stigmas, I think that you two have some interests in common that might label you different than me. <laughs> nerds? At least. Maybe. Nerds? Uh, nerds? Is that what it is? It's yeah. called nerd culture? It yeah. Is. I, I don't know what the hell I am then, because I don't understand it, but it's fascinating to me hearing you banter back and forth about this stuff. <laughs> it's funny because I'll throw out references to shit and Spencer just has no idea what I'm talking about. Even, even like the most commonly well-known pop culture references and it just doesn't track with him because like you, you didn't watch TV growing up, right? No, I had three channels growing up. And if I spent more than a half hour a day watching it, then there were problems. Yeah. And he didn't watch movies. Nope. Right. Growing up. Didn't have them. Nope. Yeah. And that was literally my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I could remember the, t my two favorite movies when I was three years old and I used to watch these every day was the original clash of the Titans with Harry Hamlin and then Grease two with <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> my sister loved Grease too. I've seen that so many times because of her and I never understood it. I love Grease too. I, I love Grease, but I love Grease too. Michelle Pfeiffer singing cool rider. Like that's my jam. Like I, 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 that, that needs to become a thing. Like I need to re, I need to make cool rider happen again. <laughs> I, I mean, don't think it, I, <laughs> I don't think it got the necessary like accolades that it should have. Anyway, that being said, Spencer has a hard time following when you and I start speaking together, Cameron, because he has really no idea some of the things that we talk about. Correct. Correct. <laughs> But I still find it fascinating and I can still I can glean a lot about both of you just by what I can understand and, and the back and forth. I, and I think it's I don't know, I think it's telling. So, I mean, yeah. so the discussion we've been having the last 12 hours plus was that you hate. Hold on. 12 hours. <laughs> They've been having a discussion for 12. I mean, we were slept, I mean, we not, slept not, part not, of not continuously, yeah. but over the pa over the past. Oh, yeah. Month. The, the the reoccurring conversation that we are having been having since yesterday evening is about this movie Anna and the Apocalypse, right? Right. Um, so give a little background. So Cameron every uh, Halloween season, every October, does thirty one days and watches thirty one, roughly thirty one horror movies, one every night. Horror Halloween um, movies, depending on when when, when movies, Jen's yeah. around. So I, I don't watch horror, but yeah. Yeah, I love Halloween. It's it's one of my favorite holidays. I watch creepy horror movies. Uh, around this time of year as well not to the extent that Cameron does but I'm also a huge horror movie junkie was growing up grew up on all the Jason all the Friday the 13th Nightmare on Elm Streets Halloween's Candyman all, so yeah I could go into that so anyway we both have an affinity for horror movies so I've been taking a cue from Cameron's book uh this year and I'm trying to watch at least one per night so last night I texted him and I said, hey, so this is what I'm watching. I started watching this movie, Anna and the Apocalypse, but I turned it off because it was so bad. To which Cameron replied. <laughs> I was like, I love that movie. It's it's basically, I, I think it was further in the conversation, but it's in my top five of all time. Of all time. Of all time. Top five, not even just top five horror movies. This movie is in, in his top five of all time. Like he ranks it. Up there with Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Okay. 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 See, even Pulp Fiction. Does that resonate with you? That actually hits with me. So even okay, e even I get that reference. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So okay, <laughs> and I, this movie had all the elements of a movie that that I would love. It was a high school movie. It has zombies. It's a musical. Like, it. It. it I was like, this is gonna be amazing. Had a seventy-seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I was just like, okay, this is gonna be awesome. And I got about 20, 30 minute, minutes into it. And I'm like, this is just crap. This is bullshit. <laughs> Cameron has a different opinion on this yeah. movie, right, Cameron? A absolutely. So so first off, 
you went in with the expectation it was going to be good. That already messes you up. <laughs> that fucked you up. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. No. And, and it's not. It's just because when things get overhyped, and you and 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 it, we hadn't even talked about it, so I didn't overhype you. But when things get overhyped, you're gonna be let down. You know, if you if you see a movie as a hundred percent of Rotten Tomatoes, you go in, you're gonna be like, okay, it was good, but it wasn't that good. So first off, that's that's one of the reasons why you have a negative opinion. The second reason is that you said, oh, the cinematography isn't good, and this other thing isn't good. I I don't remember, but you looked at it from a filmmaker's perspective. When I watch movies, I have willing suspension of disbelief. So I understand there's the filmmaker stuff, too. and okay, it's let important. Me just put, let me just put I, that get, out there. I get I you, too. but you are also looking at it from a critical perspective as a filmmaker. When I sit down and watch it, I'm like, did I love the story? Did I have fun? Were the, the songs well wasn't written? It wasn't even that great. It wasn't even that fun. Like, Here, here's I, here's I, the thing, and 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 we talked about this off mic just briefly earlier. I so related to the best friend in that movie because I have been in love with my best friend so many times in my life and she had no interest in me and it not the same best friend. It obviously was a different one every time that, that it just kills me. And so I so related to that character. And so the movie was my life. Just the zombies haven't been here yet. And I'm not that good at singing. <laughs> oh, that's great. No. So, it so was- I, I get, I get where you're coming from. You're just wrong. That's <laughs> no, okay. All right. No, I'm sorry, bro. I, I, I will wholeheartedly disagree with you. I've seen that. the movie maybe 30 times. I listened I'm to the soundtrack in my car. Like, I, c- I can't even believe that somebody would watch. I mean, the music was pretty good. I, I will give it that. The main actress is gorgeous, is beautiful, and it, I would say is a star. And But other, other than that, it just was shit. Like, it would just... Come on, I the mean, the play scene where and it's so it's I so clearly funny. I opened a can of worms. The plot, I mean, the plot. I just <laughs> it, it's just so stupid. Oh my god! Like, uh, I want and I and I wanted to like it too, and I stopped it. He said, "You have to finish it." I picked it back up and I finished the whole thing because he's like, "Oh, it's so good. You have to give it a chance." And I watched the whole thing and I'm just like texting him. I'm like, "Are you fucking kidding me? This is in your top five of all time." That's it, I I can think of. Not off the top of my head right now, but there's ah. got to be so many other best friend in love with the girl with movies. zombies in it though. You gotta yeah, remember. You gotta remember. Dude, you gotta remember zombie, who you're talking zombie. to. My license plate on my car used to be zombie, and this was before Walking Dead. This was before the big zombie craze. I'm an old school zombie fan. Literally, the license plate on my car was zombie. I got in a car accident. Someone hit me, so I was in a car accident. And the state said I had until January 1st to put it on a new car. It turns out I didn't. You only have 60 days. So they gave it to someone else and wouldn't give it back to me. So someone else has my my damn license plate. But zombie was my license plate. Know. Yeah, it's you on. Get that it, back. What it's, about okay? So, no, it's, so hold, hold on a second. It's not hold. okay. Real quick, real quick. Let me just this say it's amazing. Just, <laughs> let me just say one thing though. Real First quick. of all, okay, but real real quick. Okay, it's not the best friend in love, but uh, a, a a more amazing zombie love story movie. Um, is warm body see i thought that was okay. boring oh my god okay are you kidding me now now okay. granted it could be when i watched that movie i had just returned from the hospital because i have crohn's disease and i had eaten popcorn when i went and saw the godzilla movie the first of the the new remakes that came out the american version and mm-hmm. it blocked my intestines and i was vomiting stuff that wasn't there and had to go to the emergency room and so i watched it that night after i'd been to the emergency room so maybe my opinion is skewed i just and i have the book too i just yeah it didn't i liked it it was fine it's no anna in the apocalypse oh my god it's no anna in the apocalypse wow i would say anna in the apocalypse is nobody's warm bodies and i think the author of warm bodies is from seattle area i think too i think local person really yeah yeah i just i yeah Anyway, oh, I love this. See, <laughs> I don't understand any a of goddamn it. word <laughs> that was just said here. But at the same time, I get so much <laughs> out of that back and forth about two people who are really important and close to me that I thought it was necessary to at least get that on the record. Zed's dead, baby. What, Zed's dead. Whether we Zed's use dead. it or not, Zed's I don't know. Dead. Who's Zed? Who the fuck is Zed? Who is Zed? Zed's dead, baby. Oh, okay. It's from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> oh, fuck. I yeah. fucked myself. <laughs> I, 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 I get the Pulp Fiction reference yeah, yeah. when you say Pulp Fiction, what but if, if, you, I had if the, you pick out a small one, yeah. What if I had the pot belly? Could I crush you with my pot belly? <laughs> <laughs> you make her, you're you making her sound like, like, like Arnold Apparently. Schwarzenegger or something, though. <laughs> so, 
<clears throat> so this was are the you, kind are of. Are you trying to be uh, John Travolta? No, no, no it's like Bruce, the, Willis's, girlfriend. Bruce Willis's, Willis's girlfriend. Yeah. Like what? What accent is that? Yeah, exactly. It was a, <laughs> a vague <laughs> European accent she has. I don't know if it's French or or what. Uh, but... It's possibly it's horrible. Eastern European so, slash with a dash of French. So here's the kind of person I was though. Like I loved much. movies so much that I would record the movie onto cassette tape and then play them in my bedroom when I was sleeping so I'd fall asleep listening to Pulp Fiction, listening to Reservoir Dogs, listening to Star Wars, stuff like that. Because I didn't have a TV in my room. And so, oh. and then and then later when I got older and I did, the light keeps me awake. So I'd put blankets over it and, and stuff like that. But You just listen to the scripts. Yeah, I just wanted to listen to the movie because it would bring me comfort. And, and so it was like that or the South Park, Bigger, Longer, Uncut, which I didn't understand was a dick joke until like six months ago. I saw that actually, part. That could actually second. be the name of my autobiography. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> Time out for a second, though. South Park, you fucking fell asleep to that shit? <laughs> what would Brian Boitano do if he were here right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the, I'm the same way. Like, movies bring me comfort, right? Yeah. That when I was a kid, I would watch... I'd be obsessed with one movie, and I would watch it over and over and over again because it just... It would... Mm. Yeah, it would be like my happy place. It'd be like my safe place. As a kid, for me, it was Major League. The that we had like a HBO or Showtime free weekend, and I recorded it on VHS, and I wore I would, out the VHS. Oh my God. I would get so many movies. I'd record so many movies on the free weekend previews. I think I, the, I have v, yeah, I had drawers yeah. of VHS yep. tapes. Filled. Exactly. Yes. yes, I record. See, that's the thing is, I think Spencer's younger, so that's another reason he doesn't get our references. Is because you and I are like right exactly at the exact same time period, and mm-hmm. so. You you don't also, I was, Spencer Spencer doesn't get your references because although I love her very much my mother never in a million <laughs> fucking years as long as there was breath in her body and mine would have let me watch the shit that you guys are putting reference to period end of story I mean I have, that makes I, I sense I would have been killed first Do you remember Columbia House Do you remember the Columbia mm, House movie oh yeah, club Yeah yeah I was part of that So yeah. I was a member of the the the, the Twilight Zone columbia house where they would every six weeks would send you a vhs tape with three episodes of the twilight zone on it oh yes. <laughs> so i i was i was a big nerd but but you know the other part of it is is when i was seven years old we had a video store in my neighborhood called mlk video and this was the mid 80s so this would have been like 86 87 ish um and uh they were selling drugs from the store and so they didn't care what we rented. So at seven years old, I was renting all of the Freddy Krueger movies, all of the Friday the 13th, Jaws, Eddie Murphy Raw, Eddie Murphy Delirious, things seven years old should, seven year olds should not be watching. So I got into horror movies and all that stuff super young. Yeah, same. And so it was just a part of, and it's been a part of my life ever since. Although I have noticed that there's been a few horror movies in the last few years and I don't know if it's because of the the Dolby Cinema now, where you're completely surrounded by sound and everything, where my heart starts beating so fast that I that I, I the jump scares scare me, and I don't actually enjoy it like I used to. Uh, but at home, I still don't I don't have a problem. But in the theater, there's times where I'm too into it, and I'm just like, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a video store called Kent Video that I could walk to from my house and. My parents basically, when, when I was like 10 or 11, they basically gave me the okay. Like you could actually approve your children to rent any movie in, in, mm. the, in the video store if you wanted to. And, my, and I somehow got my parents to agree to do that. So I was renting rated R movies from like 10, 11 years old. I mean, I'd seen them before in younger age too. But like, yeah, I had basically free reign of this video store. So I was watching, I mean, anything and everything. It, it, it's uh, independent cinema was sort of booming at that time i remember Mm -hmm. and there was all this i mean just like these really obscure films that i got obsessed with like do you ever see freeway with reese witherspoon Mm -hmm. with her and Kiefer sutherland or like uh bound with jennifer tilly and Mm -hmm. gina grishan i had that on vhs yeah 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 so like there's that just that there um i think his name his director's name was greg araki i think or I, i can't remember but um, I, I was obsessed with Rose McGowan at the time, and she was in this movie called The Doom Generation that I just thought was pretty crazy. And like mm-hmm. Natural Born Killers mm-hmm. was out at that time too. Did I tell you about yeah. the time I met Rose McGowan? I was at Bush Garden, the restaurant slash uh, karaoke bar in the uh, in Chinatown here. I moved a chair out of the way for her, and she was like, "Oh, thank you." And so that was my actual like 
interaction. I think I was like, how's your day going or whatever. I didn't realize it was her at the time. I got told later. So I do, I get on stage and I do Black Sabbath's War Pigs. And I've never had this reaction from a crowd. There was so much alcohol flowing in that place that people were rocking out and it was like this is what it feels like to be a rock star rose yeah. mcgowan like jumped up on a chair or a table or something it was just rocking out in the crowd while i sang black sabbath and and i was just like this is amazing um <laughs> i think she was up her sister i believe lives around here so she was up for her sister's wedding or, or something like that but but yeah so it was it was pretty cool because one of my one of my uh friends was in the wedding party but i found out later but yeah, so that was my Rose McGowan experience. But yeah, I get Jaw- Jawbreaker would have been another movie of hers that came out. Jawbreaker, that time. yep, yep. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think my mom also didn't censor the stuff I watched. The first movie she was hesitant on was Pulp Fiction. But she would do things like take me to Terminator 2, buy two tickets, because at the time you couldn't go to R-rated movies if you were under 17, walk in mm-hmm. with me, sit down, then walk out the back walk door out. and go do yeah, whatever she my, wanted yeah. to do. My dad did that a couple of times too. There's no fucking <laughs> <laughs> I had to sneak The Simpsons. <laughs> oh, no. I From day one, my dad and I watched The Simpsons together. 1989, we started yeah. watching that together. Christmas 89-ish. No, I, I had to sneak The Simpsons on, like, <clears throat> mute with fucking closed captioning on because that shit wasn't happening. Like, no way. <laughs> so you don't know their voices. You just know the things they said. So <laughs> yeah. You're not like, don't well, have a like cow, man. I decided, fuck it. You know, like, stop, stop me. There ain't shit you can do about it. Like, I think that's kind of where part of my rebel attitude like, came hey, from. Hey, caramba. <laughs> Bart could sound like this. What are you hey, talking about? Let's go to the quickie mart. If, if you want to watch a really interesting documentary, if you haven't seen it, Hari Kondabolu, who is a comedian who lived in Seattle for a while, and he always comes back here to do his stuff. I actually was, I'm on his taping he did, his Netflix special was filmed in Seattle, and in the, I'm in the crowd. I can see myself, uh, so I'm I have a Netflix special. And yes, you do. He made a, a documentary called "The Problem with Apu," which is about how The Simpsons is his favorite show. But as an Indian American whose parents were from India, the only reference that anyone ever made to him his entire life was Apu, and how yep. destructive that felt for him. And he brings in. Southeast Asian actors and comedians and and Sanjay Gupta and like like all these these huge people to have this discussion around it and now Apu's gone he's off the show, but yep. but the whole thing was about it was kind of couched in this I want to talk to Hank Azaria about the character and it goes through the history of the character and despite what Hank Azaria says it was meant to be kind of deliberately they said do not do an Indian voice and then he did an Indian voice anyways. If you haven't seen the documentary, it's it's fantastic. It's it's a TV hour, so it's probably forty two minutes. Uh, I actually showed it in my law and society class to my students. Wow. Check it out. Okay, so I took us down All a little right, bit yeah. of a side yeah. trip there. Let's, but let's, but go, think, let's bring it back. It let's pull it back. I think yeah. Well, let's let's pull it back and let's start wrapping this up here. Definitely, but that was important. We got to see a side of both of you that <laughs> we might not have otherwise on an unincarcerated the podcast episode uh i think we just set something up for another podcast yeah Yeah. well yeah i i I have my on hiatus attack the idiot box podcast so uh we can just start doing watching movies and talking about them vic how about that i would yeah you know i'm so down for that (laughs) cool i might have fucked up by starting this but we'll see (laughs) So I, I I know you said that you had envisioned your role with Unincarcerated being very limited in the fact of just maybe doing some contracts for us and helping us with like legalese and, and things like that. But you have stepped in and taken a larger role uh, with the podcast and actually on our feature length documentary film, you've been, you know, you have basically come aboard as my producing partner on that, uh, which is a project that we're really excited about. Where do you see Unincarcerated Productions going from this point right because you are an intrinsic part of our team so what do you think the uh the future holds for us i mean i think there there's uh, tons of different avenues that it could go and hopefully will go uh there is the informative documentary type stuff which can be all over it can be about you know specific instances it can be stories of uh rehabilitation i almost said retribution that's not what i meant but then there's this whole other there's there's so many different ways to make an impact like we talked about before doing audio stuff but web videos um telling different stories i i really love the idea of the educational component of what unincarcerated could be and specifically training individuals in prison to be ready when they come out into society and 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 that could be as simple as training them 
to work with us on films or in other capacities. And, you know, I think as an educator too, like being involved with that process would be amazing. Obviously, as our discussion you saw, my passion often lies in film. And so I think I love being a producer. I love doing that kind of stuff. So for me, I see that as my focus, although I'd love to step in all those other types of things. I think the impact that unincarcerated can make is across the board, like can be changing society at different levels through different interactions with people. And that can be political, that can be social, that can be entertainment, that can be, you know, through Netflix, that can be through doing interviews on the news, that can be for through being on the daily show when you two get interviewed by Trevor Noah. You know, it's there's it's it's all over the place. That can be uh, when we accept the Academy Award. Uh, it, there's there's so many different ways it could go, right? So so uh, the what matters is how do we measure that impact? And I think it's I hate to use the phrase changing hearts and minds because that's one the military uses when they go into a place to try and make people be in favor of it. But but really it is changing hearts and minds, right? Because you have to reach their heart. If you're going to reach their mind, you can give them the academic background. They can be me and know everything. But if they know you two, if they know other people's stories that reach their heart, but you then have already prepared their mind, that's where the difference is going to come. That's when people are going to start questioning the constant barrage of negativity they get surrounding, you know, people who have been incarcerated. And I think one thing that I want to leave everyone with is... It's not just Vic and I. There are so many others. And really, we need to think, we as a collective need to think about things a little bit differently and take it beyond just those of us who are formerly incarcerated or who have had a direct experience with the quote unquote justice system or the quote unquote correction system, but also really give weight and credence to stories and experiences like Cameron's. Cameron didn't go to prison yet. We can arrange that if you want. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I'm got good. Connections and corrections. <laughs> we, got, we got connections. Don't worry. We'll let you out that same day. No problem. I've been inside but, King County, uh, the King County Jail. So I've, I've seen some of the inside and, and I know yeah. that I don't want to go back. As a collective, we, we really need to think about the stories and the journeys like Cameron's even though he hasn't been directly personally impacted as in like gone to prison uh, per se, he, his, his experience and his, his point of view and voice on criminal justice and the way that he, the way that he can impact so many other people who have similar experiences as him is really important. Right. 100%. So something I'm come away with is that it's not just about those of us who have been to prison per se, but it's about all of us and mm -hmm. how we can further unincarcerate ourselves and help each other become more unincarcerated. I think that that's something that, that maybe we haven't hit on, that becoming unincarcerated is not just being free from being in prison. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you both talk about being free from the prison in your mind, you know, mm -hmm. being free from <laughs> things that are stopping you from you know, and, and there's different levels of it, obviously, but, but th well, I mean, it goes back to our vision. Right. Our vision is liberation from imprisonment in any form. Yep. And that stems from the fact that we were both imprisoned long before we found ourselves in a jail or prison cell. Exactly. That's powerful. Cameron, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your creativity because you are creative and your vision and all the other ways that you've contributed to this team. It's been an absolute pleasure bringing you aboard and getting to know you and having you as my, our friend and partner and brother in this. And 100%. we are super excited for the future and what it holds for us. A hundred percent. I couldn't have said it better. I'm so excited to see what you do with our podcast and how you take that to heights that we never imagined. And all the other amazing things that you bring to the team that I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Thanks for sharing a little bit of yourself on this episode. Of course, I'm happy to have been here. And I think the thing I'm most excited about is since I'm the editor, I'm going to edit it so that Vic says that Annie and the Apocalypse is his favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much, guys. I'm glad. It's it's weird being on the other side of the microphone and being interviewed, since I'm usually the one doing the interviewing. And so uh, I, I'm fascinated to see what it sounds like. So I hope hopefully people out there in, in podcast land enjoy our conversation. Unincarcerated, the podcast is a joint production of Unincarcerated Productions and Grindle Industries. All of the music on today's episode, including what you're listening to now, is from the artist Speculation. You can learn more about Spec at speculation.bandcamp.com. That's S-P-E-K-U-L-A-T-I-O-N dot bandcamp.com. We will see you all in Season 2 of Unincarcerated, the podcast. <laughs>